morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Chardon from the Aging Mind Foundation. Welcome to our lecture series. Today, we have Dr. Scott Small, Director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Columbia University. His talk today is titled Therapeutic Implica oh my God, excuse me. <laughs> Implications of the Smoke versus the Fire in Alzheimer's Disease. We're gonna hear from Mercedes Carr, president of Belmont Village Senior Living and Belmont v Village Senior Living is our presenting sponsor. Hello everyone, I'm Mercedes Kerr, president of Belmont Village Senior Living. I'm pleased to introduce this installment of the Alzheimer's Research Webinar Series with the Aging Mind Foundation. For almost 25 years, Belmont Village has been home to so many interesting, accomplished and beloved residents many of whom suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's disease. We strive to create purposeful, engaging, and joyous experiences for each of them and know that our evidence-based therapeutic programs help them to live better, wellness-inspired lives. We're always learning and continuously innovating to serve our residents' needs, so I look forward to this series. But before I turn it over to our speaker, I want to reiterate Belmont Village's commitment to those who are navigating this complex and difficult condition and to remind you that we're always here to help. I hope you enjoy today's discussion. We're pleased to have Larie Halshoff, founder of the Aging Mind Foundation, to provide an overview of our mission in finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. As the founder of the Aging Mind Foundation, it is my great privilege to welcome you today to our 2021 Aging Mind Foundation Lecture Series. These lectures are generously sponsored by Belmont Village Senior Living. Our mission at the Aging Mind Foundation is to raise money to fund scientific research that seeks the cause of Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. Since 2014, we have raised over $4 million, providing research grants to the top minds in neuroscience. The short following video reflects some of the progress and impact the Aging Mind Foundation has made in years past. It is my great privilege to introduce this year's remarkable presenter, Dr. Scott Small, Director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Columbia University. Our presenters will discuss their latest advancements in their research, followed by a brief question and answer session. Please submit your questions via Zoom and they will be answered in the time allowed. Thank you so very much for your support of the Aging Mind Foundation. And by the way, I am certain you will enjoy today's lecture. Dementia is a progressive brain disease that slowly and relentlessly steals a person's memory and ultimately their identity and ability to function Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, and despite its general public image, it affects more than just the elderly. It also greatly impacts their caregivers and loved ones, and is the costliest disease in the country. With six million Americans living with Alzheimer's, the estimated cost is $355 billion per year. And as our growing population ages, cases and costs are expected to triple by 2050. It's also increasingly impacting a younger demographic as early onset Alzheimer's, diagnosed between 30 to 65 years of age, becomes more common. Dementia is a horrific and cruel disease that steals your memories, your ability to function, and erases a life lived. One in every three seniors dies with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia, and two out of three people diagnosed are women. Will you be one of those statistics? Will your partner, your children? In the United States' top 10 most deadly diseases, Alzheimer's is the only one that cannot be prevented, treated, or cured. 
And while deaths from diseases like HIV, heart disease, and cancer have steadily declined, deaths from Alzheimer's have increased. It's time that Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia begin to get the funding and attention they deserve. It's time we change the course of Alzheimer's disease. Since 2014, Aging Mind Foundation has been continually committed to raising funds for vital brain research. We're focused on funding research that seeks the cause of Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia because we must understand the root cause in order to develop treatments and prevention. Partner with us, join us, donate. Help fund the necessary brain research that will alter the course of Alzheimer's and dementia so future generations will not have to suffer the harsh realities and cruelty of losing loved ones to this disease. Let's make Alzheimer's the only memory we forget. And as we hear from Dr. Small, please submit any questions you have in the Q&A, and then we'll have a chance to hear Dr. Small's responses after his presentation. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Small. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's, uh, I'd like to thank my friends from the AMF for uh, inviting me to participate in the lecture today. I'm only sorry I can't uh, visit. I visited uh, Dallas twice and had a, a wonderful visit. Um, so hopefully that will change in the future. But today I'd like to share with you um, a presentation that is a little bit different than my normal presentations. And that's because of the really, um, I think it's fair to say earth shattering um, announcement by the FDA uh, a month and a week ago on approving a new drug, which I'm sure you're all, you all heard about. And I think you're probably well aware of a lot of the controversy that it's stirred. So usually I, I direct the Alzheimer's Center, uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Columbia I wear many hats, a clinical hat, a research hat, a public advocacy hat. Um, and usually in these talks, I really focus on the research, an academic talk, where I focus on the labs uh, attempting to understand, diagnose, and cure this horrible disease. But because of this announcement, um, I would like to give a slightly different talk. And this is, in essence, uh, a talk um, that I've been giving almost full time since this bomb dropped <laughs> in helping my colleagues across the spectrum of healthcare providers, <clears throat> my patients and their families in deciding how to um, manage this new <coughs> FDA approved drug, whether to take it or not. And at the end, uh, I'll, I'll give you very practical recommendations as I see it, and I think many of us see it. Um, but uh, I need to first start a little bit with the science, not much, but just a little bit. Um, I, I will say that this, you know, the, the, the controversy still stirs. This just came out in the Washington Post yesterday, and they have a subheading which really uh, um, isolates the problem. Amyloid clumps, amyloid plaques exist in the brain. Are they the fire of Alzheimer's? and the root cause, and therefore, would dousing that fire cure the disease. So just a few words on the biology of Alzheimer's so I can explain how this idea came about and why it's now um, being questioned in the field. And I really don't know who, who's here in the audience, um, so some of this might be obvious, some not, but I think it's good to start with the basics. So, there's Alzheimer's biology. In fact, it's different biologies. There's the histology of Alzheimer's, <coughs> what you see under the microscope, what Al was Alzheimer's himself first described in 1906. And these are the neurofibrillary tangles inside neurons and the amyloid plaques outside neurons. We know the makeup of these clumps. We have, there's tau protein that makes up NFTs and there's amyloid beta peptide or proteins that make up amyloid plaques. The tail end of the 20th century will I think forevermore be considered a golden period in Al Alzheimer's research because that's when we began in earnest to, to uh, uh, uncover the basic 
biology of Alzheimer's disease. So for example, we know it's biology. We know that Alzheimer's starts in one part of the brain before very slowly it sweeps out to other areas. Uh, and this is illustrated here. It starts in the hippocampus, a region of the brain that is critical for forming new memories. And if, if any of you know people with Alzheimer's and you think back to the very beginning, patients with Alzheimer's aren't profoundly impaired. They really just have relatively mild memory complaints that is really emanating from the disease's source anatomically in the hippocampus. At the tail end of the 20th century, we also began understanding the cell biology of Alzheimer's. Again, I don't know what people know or what, they, what, what you might remember, but cell biology essentially means that within every cell, including neurons, there are really different compartments through which proteins traffic. And it's that verb, that metaphor trafficking that we use in the literature. And in fact, it's a good one because one can think of trafficking inside neurons as sort of a train trafficking system with multiple stations. And it turns out that for neurons, Grand Central Station um, is a organelle illustrated here called the endosome, uh, and, it's and it's fundamentally affected in Alzheimer's. And here's another il illustration showing that the endosome has different pathways, uh, and it is fundamentally uh, dysfunctional in Alzheimer's disease. So at the turn of the century, this, was, this is a summary really of the state of, uh, of knowledge. Um, we, we knew about these different biologies, but we really didn't know what came first, second, or third, how, what's really driving them, what's the fire that causes all these uh, um, manifestations of the disease. And this is where genetics has been so transformative. Although as, as you'll see, uh, it might've also uh, led us slightly astray. The reason why genetics are so important is because we know that Alzheimer's is a slowly progressive disorder. Probably by the time a patient sees me, they've had the disease for decades. So by the time we see them either, either clinically or maybe uh, looking at their brains after death, we, there's a lot that has happened. And it's very, very hard to know what happens first, second or third. What's the primary root source of it all? And of course, genetics is our genes is what we're born with. And so if you can identify a gene that's causal, that truly causes the disease, that almost immediately means that it was there at birth and therefore very likely to have been a, um, uh, a driver of the disorder. Now, there's one thing I need to tell you about the different forms of Alzheimer's that was actually alluded to in the, in, in the very moving video at the beginning, and that clinically there really are two kinds of Alzheimer's disease. There's the early onset, form, which is exceedingly rare. It's probably less than five, than 1%. Its distinguishing feature is that it begins in one's 40s and 50s, maybe even younger. And this contrasts with late onset Alzheimer's disease. The vast majority of patients, if you know someone who has Alzheimer's, the odds are extremely high that they have late onset Alzheimer's, which typically uh, begins uh, manifesting profoundly in one's 60s and 70s. Now, these two bullets here are critical. They're, they're, they're genetic terminology, but they're critical because it turns out that this early onset form is autosomal dominant, which simply means that the structure of inheritance of Alzheimer's follows a very specific pattern with family, within families. And that's distinct from complex forms of disorders, which is late onset Alzheimer's, which is much more complicated. And the reason that's important is because once the genetic revolution hit and began entering biomedicine in the 80s and 90s, of course, geneticists were very interesting in, in finding the genes that are linked to Alzheimer's. But it turns out that at the time, in the 1990s, the genetic tools that were available um, were not yet sophisticated enough to investigate what everyone really wanted to know. And that's what are the genes that cause late onset Alzheimer's. We now have that and we'll come back to that, but it's relevant to amyloid plaques to say that the geneticist said, okay, well, I can't look at what we are most interested in. Let's look at this rare form because it might be informative. And this in fact led to the identification of three genes that are causative in early onset Alzheimer's disease. And 
um, it's really fascinating because what, when, if you want to know what these genes do, you need to express them. We can do that using modern biology techniques and neurons. We can express them in mouse models and we can see what happens. Well, what happens when these genes are expressed? What happens most clearly is more amyloid plaques, less so neurofibrillary tangles. And I can tell you that this was really a heady period um, in the field at the time. I was a trainee. I remember going to meetings and there was this real sense that Alzheimer's was, fig was figured out. Amyloid plaques is the upstream driver of it all. I'll come back to what happens when the genetics caught up with the complexity of the disease and we began identifying genes to late onset Alzheimer's disease. But what's relevant to the amyloid hypothesis, which has really driven uh, the FDA's approval and drug discovery uh, is the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which was articulated at the turn of the century. This might look complicated, maybe it is, but the, the main point is that the investigators relied on the genes of early onset Alzheimer's to say, well, this is just an early onset Alzheimer's, but insofar that we think that all Alzheimer's is fundamentally similar, can we extrapolate and say it's relevant to all forms of Alzheimer's? disease. And therefore, they postulated the hypothesis that amyloid plaques, this is what this basically means, is the upstream fire. And this then triggers a sort of domino effect. It will cause the neurofibrillary tangles. It will cause cell dysfunction. It will cause cognitive impairment. It will ultimately lead to dementia. And this idea was so compelling. And as an aside, I, I should say that there's been a a lot of backlash against the amyloid hypothesis. I've uh, criticized it, but it was the right hypothesis at the time. Right now it might not be, but it wasn't like this was a wrong hypothesis, although that's all it was. But it was so seductively elegant that it really mobilized the pharmaceutical industry to start developing drugs against amyloid plaques, because if this is the fire, let's douse it and everything else will go away. The well, logic is simple. And the problem is that there are now over a hundred trials that have done just that, have developed drugs that clear amyloid plaques and none of them have shown a significant impact on cognitive decline. Now, again, there's a lot of vitriol out there. And I, when, and I think Laurie knows that when I engage in in, in, in academic debate, I'm willing to be as vitriolic and, 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 and um, argumentative as anyone. But when we're thinking fairly about our field, when we're trying to translate this for our patients, we should leave that aside and shelve it and just say that um, at the time it was the right um, hypothesis. And in fact, many of the clinical trials were imperfect. They didn't really clear plaques. But many of the latest ones have, including the one that was introduced by Biogen. They cleared plaques dramatically, yet they had no effect on other downstream consequences. And yet, the FDA decided to approve it. And we'll come back to, to why that is. But fundamentally, if you really believe in this hypothesis, and unfortunately, we're left as scientists to invoke belief because the evidence is not quite there. But if you really believe that the amyloid hypothesis is right, it is plausible to say, well, you know, the clinical trials were imperfect. For those who don't know, clinical trials are very, very challenging. You need to recruit patients. Do you have the right patients? You need to give the drug. Are you giving right amounts of drug? You need to make sure that you're clearing amyloids. That's, that's not always clear. You need to measure memory. That's a very messy measurement, right? It's not measuring weight loss. So it's a lot easier. So there are a lot of excuses for why the, um, the, these clinical trials, or as they're sometimes called, the, the cemetery of 100 failed clinical trials uh, don't see clear evidence of benefit, but they still might be if just the perfect clinical trial was performed. But what has happened in parallel to these failures is that an alternative hypothesis has been developed. Um, and I'll articulate one of them. So, Remember, Alzheimer's starts in the hippocampus and not in other areas. Remember, all the cells in, across our brains have the same genes. So why is it that this area of the brain is vulnerable and others aren't? Now, it's an easy question to ask, 
But until around 10, 15 years ago, it was very, very difficult to answer. The tools, again, the issue in science is technical innovation is critical. The technical innovation was starting to come online that allowed us to address that question. And invariably, when that question is asked, what turned out to be the answer were defects in the endosome, particularly a particular route out of the endosome. And that's called endosomal recycling. That might sound like a, like a complicated term, but basically it's recycling uh, stuff out of the endosome. And it's governed by a, again, here's the metaphor of trafficking, by a, a, a conveyor belt or a train called retromer that takes things out of the endosomes and recycles it back to the cell surface. Now, I, I wanna show this movie because I think I'd like this to be accessible to everyone and I think it's interesting how endosomal recycling, this particular pathway, remember I said earlier, it's particularly important for neurons. Well, why is that? An answer emerges from this cartoon. So you know that neurons connect through synapses, neurons communicate, memory forms when that connection strengthens. And so what happens when neurons communicate is you have um, these firing of the synapses you have these proteins shown here that get internalized or endocytose to the endosome. That's the endosome there. It then decides, do I send this cargo to be degraded? Do I send it down a different trafficking route? Or, wait for it, <laughs> do I recycle the cargo back to the cell surface? And it's that recycling step that's critical for synaptic health and it's critical for memory. So insofar that tomorrow you remember anything from this talk, I can tell you with certainty that neurons in your hippocampus engaged in recycling to strengthen the connection between these synapses. So when these endosomal recycling mechanisms were discovered linked to Alzheimer's, it seemed to make sense, but that's not good enough. It really was uh, dependent on the genes to really um, uh, argue that there's a true smoking gun that this is really causal. And so remember, I showed you this slide before, now into the uh, 21st century, new, new tools for, for genetic research, large scale trials, more computational prowess, now allows geneticists, the genetic field to ask, what, are there any genes that are causal in late onset Alzheimer's disease? There are a lot of genes that are risks but are ones that are truly causal, the fire. And it turns out there's only one, and it turned out to be one of the proteins that are linked to this trafficking route, the endosomal recycling pathway. So that, that seemed to be very, very compelling. And in fact, if you now take these genes and manipulate them in, in cell culture and animal models, you can see that it recapitulates the histology of Alzheimer's, the cell biology of Alzheimer's and its anatomy. So this has given rise to an alternative hypothesis and I'm gonna show them back to back because they're different not only in elements of it but also in its um, structural organization. So here's the fire according to the amyloid hypothesis and the fire then uh, triggers everything in a domino effect. That's why it's called a cascade. Now the alternative hypothesis is that endosomal recycling is the cause of the fire. And we can say that with greater certainty because late onset genes cause this. And now what's super interesting is when people re-examine these genes that are linked to early onset gene uh, uh, Alzheimer's, yes, they cause amyloid plaques, but what they first do is to uh, cause endosomal recycling dysfunction. So you have nice coherence and that's what we like to see in science. So, the models differ on what's the fire, but here's another really important distinction, which is uh, helpful, I think, for sorting out how to decide whether to give this new amyloid reducing agent. Notice that what the literature is showing is that if you cause endosomal recycling defects in model systems, you cause amyloid plaques, but you also cause the other manifestations of Alzheimer's, but it's not a cascade. It's a hub and spoke. The hub causes one thing, it causes the other thing independently. And this model can accommodate the failures 
because if you clear plaques, you're not gonna stop the other defects of Alzheimer's to continue happening. And I think that's why this model is appealing to many. It can accommodate the failures um, of the um, amyloid reducing uh, clinical trials. Now, I promised to end with some recommendations we've all been making to healthcare providers, patients, and families in trying to decide whether to take aducanumab, or sometimes called aduhelm. It's the drug that was approved by the FDA. It reliably reduces amyloid plaques. So there really are three groups or three views. And unfortunately, they're views that are anchored mainly in belief at this point. And that's the only quibble I have with the FDA for not insisting on a few more clinical trials to be absolutely sure. In the absence of that information, we are left as healthcare providers to help our patients and families navigate through the complicated decision of whether to try it or not. Three views will dictate a healthcare provider's recommendation. If you are of the view that amyloid plaques are tr the true fire, and there's still a lot of people out there, you might say, I will recommend it because I don't care what the clinical trials say. I believe it's gonna ultimately have a dramatic benefit for my patients. So ethics first, right? The other view, which is sort of the inverse of that, are those who say, well, amyloid plaques are just the smoke, not the fire. There are other things, maybe endosomal recycling, maybe something else is the fire. And the, fire, and the smoke is really not detrimental. So why would I give a drug that not only is extremely expensive, can cause side effects, can affect lifestyle, when I don't believe as a healthcare provider that it's gonna do anything. I think if you're of those views, your decision is relatively straightforward. I mean, it's still complicated on the cost and who should get it, a lot of complexity, but fundamentally you're starting with a position that dictates a simple recommendation. Unfortunately, I'm in the middle view. The middle view, which I, I am of this view that um, amyloid is the smoke, not the fire, but just to belabor the metaphor, smoke could be detrimental. I do believe that clearing amyloid plaques at some stage in Alzheimer's disease will confer some mild benefit. It won't cure the disease, but it could improve slightly or mildly or some. But the reason that kind of word is really important because now we're in the position of doing a sort of risk benefit analysis, which we prefer not to do in, um, in medicine. You know, take your COVID vaccination. I know there are some naysayers, but that's a sim simple recommendation. Here, now when I sit down with patients and families, I have to sit down and explain to them that there might be some mild benefit on the benefit side, but on the cost side, they're 40% risk factors. Some of them can be devastating. It's extremely expensive. Uh, I've had a family who said, look, I'm willing to mortgage my house to take this drug and I advise them against it. So it becomes a sort of tilting balance, which is really difficult to sort through. And then finally, I'd like to just end by saying that whether you find this compelling or not, remember the, in, 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 no matter how elegant this hypothesis is, just like this was elegant, this has elegance, I assure you. But in medicine, elegance doesn't determine truth, right? We can use lawyers terminology by saying that there's enough elegance here to bring endosomal recycling to trial, but we need a clinical trial where we uh, give a drug that corrects endosomal recycling defects and only then see, do we really make a difference? That's the only way to know beyond a reasonable doubt that endosomal recycling is truly the fire in Alzheimer's disease. And I'll end by saying that there are, the good news there is that there are now a lot of drug companies that are now developing. There are drugs out there that are being tested or developed or too early uh, uh, to be administered, but in a few years, hopefully they'll be available. And also, um, you should know uh, on um, full disclosure, et cetera, et cetera, that I'm part of one of these companies that's trying to develop uh, these drugs, essentially to disprove or disprove this, to prove or disprove the hypothesis. And uh, we're very formal about this. So I'd like to open it up for questions. I'm sure there are many. 
Scott, thank you for that great presentation. We've got seven questions for you. Do you want to read them or would you like us to read them for you? Any which way is, is fine or the questioner can just uh, ask me whatever you think is right. Okay, okay, we'll read them to you. Um, we've got them all set up. Uh, actually, I'm gonna have you read them. Can you see them on your screen? I'm sure I can if I get out of share mode. I see, I think four, uh, four questions. I'll take it from the top. Yep. Uh, the Q and A. On the uh, Q and A part. Oh, it's the Q and A. I'm sorry. Got it. Yes, yes. Thank you. They're all set up for you. Ready to go. Okay. Uh, so I'll read them for everyone, and I apologize if I misread. Uh, hi, my dad is is in assisted living. My husband's job took us 400 miles away. It seems. He seems to still recognize me, but he also seems to think my sister is me and, and any male is me. He confuses me with my husband, I guess. Recently, he thought my brother was my husband. They look nothing alike. I call dad on grandpa a couple of times a week. My question is how crucial is it for me to make in-person, to make in-person, um, I think that might be a misspelling or I'm having uh, 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 maybe in-person visits See, since he does not recall one minute later, I have three siblings. Okay, so if, if, if the questioner doesn't, met, doesn't mind, Beth, I think what you're asking is a really incredibly good question. And that is, it, particularly at a certain stage, uh, it's, it's when Alzheimer's truly becomes cruel, not so much to the patient, but to the family when they start, when they stop, when they start forgetting loved ones. How does, how does one manage that um, behaviorally? By which I mean, I often have patients asking me, should I keep on correcting my loved one? Um, uh, the one easy answer is never get frustrated. I see that a lot particularly in the early stages, particularly among spouses. Um, there's a certain frustration because typically the patient, uh, you know, just 10 years ago was sharp and intact. And if they forgot something, it meant they were being neglectful and it provokes marital frustration. So, or, and so I think it's obvious to say no frustration. This is not the patient's fault. They're not willful. They're not absent-minded. This is the disease speaking. In terms of the more specific question, if I understand its essence, I do think, I do think it's important that you keep on visiting uh, your loved ones. Um, what's really interesting, I talked about how Alzheimer's progresses over time. Even if they don't completely recognize you and think of your name, there are parts of the brain that are still functioning. And one of the things that my patients have taught me, and they've taught me a lot over the years, is that we tend to over-index you know, raw information, memory of names, memory of events, what I ate for breakfast. But I have a lot of patients who don't remember those details quite well, but they still are emotionally intact. They laugh, they love, they're inspired by art, they're moved by their family. The frustrated part is that you don't really know, but on the assumption that they are still responding to you um, lovingly and that love helps, and I can tell you it does, even though I'm a basic scientist, I would recommend that you keep on visiting your, your family members, yes. Okay, so there's a question from, Corey, what causes them not to be recycled properly? So I think, Corey, you're asking the sort of technical question. I talked about the recycling of proteins. And basically, you need this molecular machine that's called Retromer to recycle back. And Retromer is, is complicated. It's made up of many, many elements. And many things could affect that um, that, that molecular machine. So think of it maybe back to the metaphor, there's a train track that's intact, but the train is not working. You're gonna be stuck in the endosome in Grand Central Station or the equivalent in Dallas. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, and a lot of things can cause it. So SORL1, those mutations, that causes it, but that's easy. We're starting to show that some risk factors like obesity and type, two di type one diabetes could affect retromer. Uh, and its constellation of molecules. Um, so there probably are a lot of things that affect this pathway. Uh, and that's why complex Alzheimer's has many etiologies, but they do seem to converge on this pathway. 
I hope that answers the question. I'll move on to Sandy. Are there any other drugs on the horizon that can assist with memory? Um, well, I, I, first I'd like to distinguish memory. I think a lot of people want better memory as younger people. We all want better memory. I actually am just publishing a book on the benefits of normal forgetting. It's coming out by, uh, by random, uh, published by Random House. It'll be out next week. So normal memory is something you probably don't want to try to enhance. I think what you're asking is pathological forgetting. So Alzheimer's, are there things down the road that might improve that? And I, I would like to hope that my talk, if anything, engenders cautious optimism. When I started my career 20 years ago, I was pessimistic because it was clear that we weren't really in the right ballpark. There was no chance we're going to hit a home run if the lights are off. But I think we're now in the right ballpark. There's the pathway I talked about. There are a few other pathways. Once, to use a mechanics cliche, once you know what's broken, the odds are we'll know how to fix it. So there's optimism. I fear though that it's not the kind of optimism you would like to hear. I can't say that it's a year away. It's a, it's a good few years away, okay. Uh, so where are we? Uh, is someone, so is it Michael next? Maybe someone from AMF can help me because yep. I don't, okay. If, if someone decided to take this new drug, how long would you recommend it being taken to show efficacy or not? Excellent question. And you know, the real, I think you all appreciated that I try to stay away from the vitriol of the process, uh, even though I'm engaged in it. I try to focus my bandwidth on helping my patients. But you saw on my first slide that Congress is reviewing the process. Um, one of the really frustrating things is that we will know how dangerous this drug is because if there is any side effects, you have to report it to the agencies. But there's no requirement on reporting how beneficial or not it is. And so one of the things where a lot of the centers like mine are scrambling to do is to sort of do the work that we think the drug companies should have done. We can't do a formal clinical trial, but we can track patients in a very, in a, in a semi-formal way, compare them to patients who are not taking it and really get a handle on what we really don't know how beneficial it is. I would say um, if, if it is prescribed, the math is very simple. If there are any side effects, you obviously stop it. Um, and that's not always true, right? If, you know, think of all the side effects we're willing to accept for an effective cancer drug, right? So there are a lot of side effects that are acceptable if we really believe the drug <laughs> is gonna make a dramatic difference. Um, and uh, you know, you can just, what, what I do with Aricept, there are other drugs we've been given for a decade, I take the same view, I, I give it, and I let the patient, patient's own chemistry teach me, does it help them not, is there any side effects or not? The key difference is that Aricept is a few you know, dollars a pill and it's ex exceedingly safe. So that's a complicated one. So who's next, uh, is it Alvin? Next or one is what? Alvin. Okay. Uh, what is the name of the gene? Okay, <laughs> the name of the gene is SORL1. It stands for uh, sorting receptor one. It's part of the endosomal sorting and trafficking. It's a receptor of that trafficking complex. And um, we first stumbled on it when we were asking why the hippocampus, but that wasn't genetics. Then geneticists found it and found that it is causal. Maybe I could take this moment to say something quickly about the distinction between causal and risk genes. That's a complicated one. And I, I, I think it's important, even though it's complicated. So um, many of you probably know that there are many things that are risks to what we do and many things that cause, right? So the, 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 if I've used the, uh, the fire metaphor, a causative gene uh, starts the fire, a risk gene kindles the fire, but the fire needs to be there, right? So there are a lot of risk genes that are interesting. You might've heard of APOE or TREM2, and they might be good to target therapeutically, but they don't start the fire, but still reducing the kindling might matter. So it is interesting. And in this case, uh, you know, lucky for those who, 
who were studying Retchmer 10 years ago, that SORL1 turns out to be the only causal gene in late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, so is it Jan or Sandy? Jan or? Next. Who? Sandy. Right. She asks, uh, she knows someone who recently has been diagnosed and what is the biggest piece of advice you would give their caretaker or the patient? Well, that's a good question. It's often conditioned on what stage um, the patient is. I, I talk about this a little bit in the book. Um, it's surprising to me because I am a biologist who's trying to develop drugs that what turns out to be the most beneficial thing we can do with all our patients is what I call psychosocial management, which is helping them live their lives with poor memory. We don't really need a memory. We have our cell phones, we have family, we have healthcare providers, we have all the uh, uh, nurses and staff that I, I'm feeling are watching. That's the most important way that I help my patients um, uh, I prevent my, pa my patients from really suffering from Alzheimer's. Most of my patients, if they're lucky enough to have loved ones, if they're lucky enough to have insurance, can live relatively fulfilling lives, particularly in the early stages when they have pathological forgetting. They get into trouble though, when that forgetting causes them to forget to take their pills, to get lost while driving, to lock themselves out on a snowy night. That's the kind of things that we can really help them with. And that's the recommendation for all stages of Alzheimer's. Okay, Jan, what is the time frame of testing and potential release of new drugs based on the current research? Yeah, you know, I, I think doctors, for some reason we borrowed this old Soviet five-year program. You remember the old Soviet Union would say, you know, in five years, we're gonna do it. And there's something about five years that people like when they predict the future, somehow because it's long enough that if we make a prediction, no one's gonna remember and, and call, call us the task, but it's not too far that it engenders pessimism. I don't like that sort of five-year unit because that's not the way biology works. What I could say is that if you're in the right playing field, there's real optimism that you'll hit a home run. I think it's easy to say that if you're not, you're never gonna hit the home run. Is that home run a year away, three years away, five years away? I, I really am reluctant to make that prediction, but I can really tell you with, with, with honesty that there's reason to be cautiously optimistic that in the next few years, there'll be meaningful changes, okay. Richard, do you think the approval of aduhelm is good for the future of Alzheimer's pharma development since so many prior compounds failed to reach approval? Excellent question. And since um, I told you that I am involved, in fact, I have been involved, uh, I, I sat on the advisory board of Janssen & Janssen. So I try not to kind of sit in my ivory tower and pontificate. I try to get dirty working with pharma because the good pharma wanna do it right. And what's really interesting is that in many ways, despite all the controversy, this approval has had the silver lining of accelerating drug discovery for a lot of reasons. Some of them not excellent reasons, but in, on balance, I think uh, investors and companies are now re-engaging Alzheimer's disease because I think there's a sense that we're onto something. There's a sense that we can use biomarkers for approval. So that's a silver lining. It's not worth the confusion that ha it has engendered in my patients, however. Uh, Paul, you presented an almost autosomal dominant with regard to early, I have two copies of APOE4, and I understand that I am greater risk of late onset Alzheimer's than my parents uh, were because APOE seems to be in a recessive trait. So um, yes, APOE4 is a risk factor. So remember we made the somewhat simplistic distinction between causal genes and risk factor genes. So I will use that question to expand on what I meant. So APOE4, even if you have two copies, which is not what you typically would want, is a risk for Alzheimer's. There are many people who are APOE4-4, two copies, who don't get the disease. There are many people who don't have any APOE and get the disease. That's different than a causal uh, mutation. If you have the causal mutation, you will get the disease. So that just makes a distinction. Now, within the category of risk diseases, you can then start asking, well, what is the risk? There are some genes that confer 
a 10% risk. There are those that confer a 60% risk. And APOE is on the ones that increase, are in the higher side of risk. So yes, it is a concern. It's something you know you should track with your doctors. And hopefully by the if if this if if you are unlucky enough where this will at some point in the future manifest uh, into Alzheimer's, maybe by then we'll have meaningful interventions. Scott, thank you very much. Um, this was an excellent, excellent presentation and the questions were great. Um, you mentioned that your book uh, is coming out. Would you like to tell us the name of your book and when it's gonna be published? Sure, if you don't mind. You know, one, one of the hard parts of this book is that because it's I, my first time saying yes to writing a, uh, a, a general science book, is that I have a publisher, I have an agent, I have a publicist, I have marketing, and it makes me feel uncomfortable on the publicity, but you'll see I'm getting over it by saying yes to your offer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is, and I think it's an important book because everyone's worried about their normal forgetting. It's the inverse of what I do. It's an inter it was an interesting book to read. It's called Forgetting, The Benefits of Not Remembering. So. It's God forbid not saying that pathological forgetting is beneficial. Sometimes doctors commit that sin of poeticizing pathology. No, there's no silver lining. This is about the forgetting that we're all born with. And we somehow think it's a nuisance. It's, it's just a, uh, you know, um, a, a remnant. Uh, and we all wanna have these photographic memories. What's really interesting, it comes out of the new science of forgetting that argues that forgetting and memory are distinct and having normal forgetting in balance with memory is really, really important. So it's coming out, you can find it on Amazon. <laughs> it's published by Crown um, and uh, it seems to be doing very well. So I am delighted by it. It was, a, it was an interesting experience. Great, thank, you, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And again, thank you for your presentation today. It was excellent. We have recorded the presentation today and it will be on the Aging Mind Foundation YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be on the YouTube channel by Friday and it will also be on the Aging Mind Foundation website. Again, thank you for um, your presentation today, Dr. Small. Our next uh, lecture will be on September 14th and Dr. Michael Rugg from the University of Texas Dallas Center for Vital Longevity will be our next speaker. Again, thank you all for joining. Could, and again, could, I, could I just say, first of all, thank you to you and, yes. and for inviting me. Thank you for the listeners for the great questions. And let me make a plug for, for, for Michael. He's, he's one of the true geniuses in the area of psychology, of understanding how the mind works that relates to Alzheimer's. I would not miss his lecture. He's a, he's a gifted speaker. Well, great. Thank you. And we'll send you that invitation. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. And again, thank you, Scott. Bye, everyone.